how unfit people view the world, visually see the world, as opposed to how fit people view the world. It identifies a, perhaps a physiological or psychological differences between fit and unfit people, but it also provides a path to remedy that. Yes, out of my lab, but also out of several other labs, there's been work looking at that relation between states of the body and visual experiences. They haven't necessarily tried to integrate the motivation science element to it, but they were looking to see do visual experiences change as a function of different states of our body. So they've looked at people who experience chronic fatigue, the elderly, people who are overweight, those that are wearing heavy backpacks and so who are sort of put into that experience of being overweight. What happens to their perceptions of the environment? Well, what they find is that Distances look further to those that are overweight, chronically tired, older rather than younger, weighted down with, with extra baggage. Distances look farther and hills look steeper. We've done some of those studies too, where we try to like give people more energy or, or deprive them of, of energy and see, does that change their perception of space? And we did that by sort of a classic technique of a double blind study where the participant doesn't really know the, the full extent of what they're doing or what they're experiencing. And the researcher who's interacting with them also doesn't. In this case, what we did was give people Kool-Aid to drink. For some people, that Kool-Aid was sweetened with sugar, an actual caloric entity. It could give them energy. Other people drank Kool-Aid sweetened with Splenda. So yeah, it's sweet, but it actually doesn't have any caloric value. You're not giving people energy. You're just giving them that, that experience of sweetness. Now, some people, of course, are really good at identifying like what's real sugar and what's Splenda. But when you put it in a Kool-Aid, a pretty noxious powder, it actually masked it for everybody and nobody had any idea. Because it tastes like garbage it to everybody. It tastes like garbage. Sorry, yeah. Kool-Aid. I mean, I'm sure there are many people that love Kool-Aid. I yeah. guess the sales of Kool-Aid will, will reveal the data. You're drinking Kool-Aid to start your day? Really? It's so good. What kind? Red. Kool-Aid is fucking awesome. It really is awesome. <laughs> it's so good. Take a little, pour a little something for yourself. It's, wa it's watered down. It's not too bad. You really drink Kool-Aid? It's ice cold. It's ice cold. Yeah. You are drinking Kool-Aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> You're drinking a full 64 ounce That's half a gallon of Kool-Aid. <laughs> I grew up in Nebraska, actually, where Kool-Aid is from. It originated in Nebraska. Wow. So I do feel like I'm betraying my roots slightly by casting some shade on Kool-Aid. But that's how it worked is that, you know, we asked them to guess what they got. We tested them afterwards and they were wrong. So nobody is able to guess with accuracy what was your drink sweetened with, which is important because they were blind the way that scientists use it. They didn't know what it was that they were drinking. Give them about 10 to 15 minutes for that sugar to metabolize. And we measured their circulating blood glucose levels to make sure that we had in fact given their body glucose energy that they might use in the next activity. And the researcher again didn't know whether they had just served sugar or Splenda. Then we asked people to estimate distance. So we gave some people more energy or we kept others sort of at like whatever their normal level was. And what we found is that those people who didn't even know it, but who had been given more energy by drinking Kool-Aid sweetened with sugar, perceived their space as more constricted. They, that visual illusion of proximity was induced. They felt that their finish line, again, in the context of an exercise task, was closer to them. So in just the same way that these other physiology labs, vision science physiology labs, found that people who are chronically tired, who don't, have, don't feel like they have as much energy, or those that are physically weighted down and for whom you know, moving within an environment is more costly, we could create that experience for people. We did an experimental version of that, that if you have more energy, the world looks easier. The distances to a finish line don't look as far. So that was some of the experimental evidence that we had to show that people's states of their body do impact their visual experience. Now, I'm a motivation researcher, so for me, the big question is, well, what's the point of that study then, besides just showing this connection between the body and the eyes and the visual experience? We think that that's fundamental to one of the reasons that people experience difficulty when they're exercising, when it's really harder for your body because of its physical state to move within a space. 
you might say like, well, why don't they just go exercise? Because the world looks harder to them. Because that distance that they're supposed to walk because a doctor tells them to, or that a partner encourages them to, or a hill that they should hike up because someone told them that would be good for their health, it looks more challenging to them than it does to somebody who is in better physical health. Now, if it looks that way, if it looks harder, if it feels like it might be harder, then psychologically we know that it is. When you have set yourself up psychologically, mentally for that kind of failure experience, like, I don't know that I have the resources that, to get this job done. This, this looks really hard. You're already motivationally in a place for this task to be closer to impossible for you. So to put it all together then, what we know is that people whose bodies might make it more challenging to, for them to exercise are seeing the world in a more challenging way, and that is having these downstream motivational and psychological effects that makes it less likely for them to try to take on the task in the first place or to experience it as harder than other people would or do. Is the solution the same, however? Meaning, if these people are taught to adjust their visual goal line or to mm -hmm. set a visual spotlight on yeah. an intermediate goal, can they overcome some of this challenge that they face simply by virtue of their skewed perception? Yes. So in all of the studies that we have done, looking at that connection between this narrowed focus of attention and improvements in exercise, we do not find that it only works for the people who are in shape or that it backfires for people who are out of shape. It works for everybody. This is a strategy that everybody can adopt because it's just simply about like, what do you allocate attentional resources to? What do you sort of ignore? And what do you focus on? That visually induces the same kind of illusion for everybody, regardless of whether you're overweight or you're, or you're at your target weight, or if you're struggling to get there or you've already accomplished where you wanna be. That visual illusion can be induced for everybody and it has the same kinds of consequences. At a high level, our brains are responding to our psychology as well. And we have that great power to really, with intention, with practice, decide how do I want to engage with the world? And can it produce real change in our, in our bodies and in the way that we experience the world? The answer is yes. Okay, hold on. It's pretty good. It's, it's not that... <laughs> it's good, right? It's good. It's a, you should drink... <laughs> 64 ounces. I had to drink two of them. I had to drink two every day. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna. I'm gonna be. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I don't know that uh, there's another adult man in the country that has some fucking talent of Kool-Aid. I didn't even know you were into Kool-Aid. Oh, I love it. You've never mentioned Kool-Aid before. Oh, I drink Kool-Aid every day. I love Kool-Aid. You drink Kool-Aid every day? Yeah, probably about 120 ounces. <laughs> <laughs> You don't think that's not adding calories though? No, <laughs> it's not. It's, it's low calorie Kool Aid. Yeah, no. They, most doctors recommend it. 